Okay. So yeah. Keith is a very good friend of mine. We've known each other for over 12 years. And he also has a YouTube channel, uh, Keith, Keith Griffin, right? We'll put that link yeah. in the description, the comment section below. So Keith is, correct me if I'm wrong, you, you'll, be, you'll be voting for Kamala Harris Absolutely. come Tuesday. Yeah. Um, and I'm definitely not voting for Kamala Harris. Uh, and I still haven't decided who I'm voting for, truly. So I'm still trying to figure that out. And uh, Hans, did you want to say who, you, who you're going to vote for? Yeah, I already voted for Trump. I really, yeah, that was not the plan earlier this year, but that's how the card shook out. I yeah. watched your last video. That's, I, I know who exactly you guys are voting for. It's cool. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. But what's going to make this conversation interesting is that I, what I'm trying to figure out is why somebody would vote for, for Kamala Harris truly, because I'm having a very hard time seeing how she's going to be elected in, on Tuesday, my personal opinion. And we were going to bring Keith on to have a very fun discussion without any alcohol, which is probably a bad idea. It's just trying to really understand how we're sort of thinking about this going on to Tuesday. And with the amount of interest on this election, with the amount of people that are curious to hear people's takes, this is just going to be a super fun discussion and hopefully uh, a productive one as well. Go ahead, Hans. So, well, besides the, you know, who you're voting for doesn't necessarily define your approach to politics. And so I'm curious, like, would you define your politics as independent, as modern progressive, classical, liberal? Um, where on the spectrum of, you know, political thought would you really identify with the most? So actually it's a great question. Um, I would, I, I do not consider myself a Democrat. I will point that out. I do consider myself progressive. So when you talk about progressive policies that are very familiar throughout the, throughout the world, talking about universal healthcare, affordable education, you know, uh, you know, aff you know, affordable childcare, you know, things that, you know, meat and potato, you know, issues. Like I all, I'm very, I, I lean left on all those issues. Um, socially, I, I lean a little bit, right. You know, I, I'm very much, you know, I, I'm not real big on some of the, you know, far, far left, you know, you know, he, him, she, her issues. I don't care about those. I'll be frank with you. It's about 1% of the people. It does not impact your normal person. It actually bugs me a lot that the Democrats focus so much on that because it takes away from the things we should be talking about. It takes away from affordable housing. It takes away from how we're groceries down. It takes away from education. I got three kids. They're going to be spending a half million dollars to get an education in college at this rate. Right. You know, I got, um, again, goes back to healthcare. You know, I, I spend, you know, $2,500 a month to supplement healthcare. Then I'm gonna have to go to the doctor's office and pay another thousand dollars anyway. So these are things that we need to be focusing on as opposed to the, the, the small sliver that frankly are going to vote Democrat anyway. So that, that part does bug me. Um, I, I will just close that with saying that politics is a bus stop. You go with the party and let's it, like it or not. The reality is it's a two party system right now. And you have to change it within said party, right? Trump's changing it because he hijacked the Republican party. Right. If the, if the Democrats change or if, if the left changes in America, it's going to be because of a fundamental shift within the Democratic Party. Some third parties are going to roll in and take over. That's just not realistic at this moment. So, like I said, it's a bus stop. And right now, the Democrats, the powers that be, not even Kamala, you know, the power brokers, whatever that be, what they are preaching or what they would at least, you know, attempt to do reflects more of what I would like to see in the society. Okay. And then, sorry, I just wanted to real quick mention this because I think it's important. I You previously identified as Democrat. Is that an accurate assessment? I mean, you could say that, but, uh, but this, the, the thinking hasn't changed. You know, okay. again, there are a lot of things that Democrats do that I do not like. So what but, caused you to, so what caused you to kind of shift away from that label? I mean, I'm not even like, I'm a registered Democrat. Like I'm going to vote mostly Democrat. But it's not, but again, that doesn't mean to me, you know, again, you talk about, we talk about like patriotism, and everything to me is that one of that is you're calling out the garbage that you see from the people you support. So it's yeah. not like I'm, it's not, it's, I would not consider myself an independent in today's modern, you know, in today's modern, you know, political field, however you want to, you know, view that there's just okay. too many things I've seen from the GOP, whatever GOP, your dad's GOP, you know, McCain and Bush and all them. 
Trump's, particularly Trump's GOP, that I, that I, I cannot bring it upon myself to support them either for, you know, fist for policy reasons, for personal reasons, you know, character reasons, um, whatever it may be, they just are very different than how I view, you know, the world and how I would like to see the country go. Okay. Han, sorry that I meant to interrupt you earlier. Go for it. No, I, I don't even remember what I was going to ask. So, okay. Um, really- okay. So, so one of the, we, we have, we have an automated, uh, 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 which I'm gonna call it, uh, editor that's gonna remove these gaps all on its own. It's pretty awesome. Um, I mean, well, for I think the over, I will just call it like the overarching ten thousand foot view, is that I honestly believe that it's not necessarily is that well, I, I sense a lot of just overall anger, which is we'll call it the establishment, which is easy because ma- mainstream media sucks. I mean, nobody's. I'm, I'm not gonna sit here and defend mainstream media like oh yeah msnbc they're the straight shooters like you know, i'm not going to, i'm not going to do that right um but it, i did find it very interesting because just it, it, it almost felt like a vote for trump was a vote for change is that fair to say Hans? yeah i i definitely view it as a vote for change i know that's kind of difficult given the fact that he already had you know a kick at the can so to speak yes at this um but the the types of people and that he is surrounding himself with this time actually does feel dramatically different than the types of people he surrounded himself with the last time around you know i'll take an elon musk over a john mm-hmm. bolton you know 100 times out of 100 maybe 200 times out of 100 um I would take, look i would take elon musk over john bolton a thousand times over a thousand um, because while I pro- profoundly disagree with politically political Elon, I mean, I own Tesla stock. You can't, I mean, he, he's a, a business. Elon is awesome. I will say this. I do have an issue with Elon as a person. Like sometimes I'm not saying you guys, but there tends to be a, oh, Elon is, is great or God or, or whatever. Yeah, can know. do no wrong. Yeah, for sure. 100%. Exactly. He is. Yeah, yeah. You know, he is our savior. Whatever. Look, Elon's a person, and business Elon is amazing. But you know what? He's also a billionaire. Yeah, that's just facts, right? And he's, he's also a businessman. And yeah, the, the and decisions that he's making now have a business calculation element to them. Thousand percent. Not only now. Look, is he? My, maybe he's a little salty because Biden screwed him. Probably. But you know what? He's also got like 10 different, 11 different court cases that the government, that different government agencies are coming after him for. Trump also cut, you know, taxes from like 32 to 23, I think it was corporate tax rate last time. And you bet your ass he'll do it again if he's in office. That's billions of dollars saved for Elon. So, I mean, yeah, may, I mean, maybe he agrees with what Trump says, but he has a lot of different interests that aren't necessarily my interests that would, you know, that could skew the, you know. And I think this is definitely going to place where you and I would disagree because I've been, you know, a Ron Paul libertarian leaning, not like full on, but, um, you know, I would say that's the, the strongest element of the political landscape that I identify with. And it's been interesting to see Elon kind of migrate from the Democratic camp over to align more with my values. And so, I mean, I, you know, my personal assessment of how we solve the problems that you want to solve um affordable food affordable housing affordable health care all these things like the reason that i'm a libertarian is that i think that the size of government is the biggest thing that stands in the way of having affordable all of those things and so dramatically slashing the size of government and making it more uh efficient but also more capable um, like, I don't think the government needs to go away. We need government and we need good government, but we also need a government that's highly accountable and it hasn't been for, you know, a long time. And so that's where I think, you know, on these specific issues, while I, I agree with the the problems that we need to solve, I think our solutions would probably be different. And, and Elon's proposed solutions to those problems align with what I think is actually going to work. Yeah, I mean, I've never, I mean, last time we had zero regulation, in government, they were like strip mining the tops of mountains, polluting rivers, 
you know, you had like pre Nixon EPA, New York city was like, you know, couldn't see half a mile down the road because of the smog. Like, I don't, I would never, I do not think that very extreme cuts of regulations and things of that nature is the, is the solution. Again, we probably disagree on that. Oh, um, furthermore, I think one of the biggest issues are, look, our government is not perfect. It's nowhere near perfect. In fact, I would argue that it's probably the least efficient and one of the most corrupt in the, in the developed world. I, I would argue. I don't think I will get a, a I think all three of us else. are a hundred percent on that. Yeah. yeah. But what I will say is that one of the, my favorite, one of my favorite presidents is Teddy Roosevelt. And the reason is, is because he was a trust buster. He took these monopolies or oligopolies and he broke them up. And then that fostered competition. And that's what I would love to see. You know, I know Biden did it a little bit. He did it with like Live Nation, screw Live Nation. I'm cool with that. You know, he, he did it with a couple other companies. I would love for the government to actually step in to break up some of these companies, you know, hell, a Verizon or at and or, um, you know, maybe some of the airlines, um, so on and so forth, that they're either oligopoly or monopoly so that you could have more competitive pricing and more competitive. I mean, yeah. hell, when you go to a grocery store, you've got like seven companies that you're choosing from. It's an illusion of choice. Everything in that grocery store is one of seven companies and they're yeah. probably not competing with each other. And we can say it's inflation all day long. You can't tell me that if you got seven companies that control everything, that doesn't have a, that doesn't have a, um, an impact on pricing. Yeah. So I, th I think that's a fair point. I, I would say, I would say that the analogy you use for a Teddy Roosevelt being one, a goat president because of his trust busting, yeah. the analogy I would use is that we need a president like that, but for government. And the reason why I say that is if you really think about what are the highest costs to American taxpayers today, defense and healthcare by far, what mm -hmm. are the two most corrupt things in the United States government, healthcare and defense, sure. right? Is that, is that a fair argument? And, yeah, and why is I, it corrupt? But well, let, let me finish my thought here. Let I mean, me finish my thought. Let, let yeah. me finish my thought. Right. Yeah. So, so why is that corrupt? Because we have this feedback loop of people that are continually in government that are either ex pharma or ex defense or have close ties to them that write laws explicitly or get us into foreign wars explicitly with the goal to enrich those companies. And all those people are in government. They are the ones that are enabling all those things, right? And 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 so like we were talking about, hey, like like you know, John Bolton is a scumbag. Elon Musk, you have an issue with Elon Musk supporting Trump, right? But my biggest red flag is who does D Dick Cheney support? <laughs> That's like one of my biggest red flags, right? Because if we think about what is Dick Cheney to me, Dick Cheney is like that. It's like back in the two thousands, the the Democrats. Uh, let's call him enemy number one, right? I think that's a fair categorization. This is the guy that is likely responsible for the deaths of a million innocent people because he he really tried to push the United States to get itself into a war that it didn't need to be in, right? And then this person, you would think, probably has a lot of vested interest in who he picks as president because then he thinks that president is going to enable him and his system that he's around to continue on that path of, you know, making the world into the image of the United States through uh, exporting peace, which I think we have a lot of data points that say that is an incorrect, it does not work, right? So that I view that and I'm like, that is not the Democrat party that I connect with. It has, it has transformed into something different, right? And then when I view, like say, and if I use the Elon Musk example, right? Definitely not perfect. I don't agree with all his politics. I think sometimes his existentialism gets the best of him when it comes to the United States specifically. Whereas, like, you know, this is the end of democracy and stuff. I'm like, you know, if Kamala gets elected, I'm like, that's, you're taking it too far. I, I can see how you can sort of logic through it in a way, but it's just not, to, for us to get there would require so many just completely broken, fundamentally insane steps for the next five to 10 years that it's like, forget it. Like it, it, I just think the likelihood of that happening is insane. But so I think that gets the best of them. Right. But, but I much rather put my sort of vote behind the party that exudes those ideals because that individual has a track record of doing a lot with a little, right? He has done a lot with a little Tesla, SpaceX, Neuralink, boring company. Yeah. So on and so forth. And so in my head, I'm like, okay, if we can, 
if we can somehow capture that essence and apply that to the United States government to where we don't have this insane waste with pharma and defense and we don't have a situation where Boeing gets double the money than SpaceX and they send and they return zero astronauts while SpaceX returns 13 different missions, right? If we can take that ideal and apply it to the United States government, like we have we have a track record of that working, right? And so that's that's what I'm like, okay. To me, the Harris administration is more of the same. More of the same, right? That's the vibe I get. And that is like what they have to what they have to help me understand how how it's any different. Because I don't get the vibe that a Harris administration is going to fix anything. They're just going to maybe chip away here and there a little bit, call it a victory, and then the machine continues. The 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 that that ceiling continues to go up. The deficit continues to go up. Right. That's that's where I'm at. No, and the wars specifically. Continue. And the wars, exactly. Well, we could talk about the look. We can talk about the Ukraine war in a little bit if you guys like, because that war is a war I actually am in in favor of. Now. As far as the defense industry goes, we have what eight hundred billion dollars a year or something like that. We're giving the defense industry yeah eight six Z nine hundred or something. Insane. I mean, and they've tried to audit the Pentagon numerous times. It just gets lost to a black hole. You know why? Because everybody's taking pay cuts or, pay, or you know, everybody's getting handouts, right? I mean, God knows what those generals actually really make. You know, so I mean, I, I will, I will sit here. I will not sit here and say, oh, guys, no, our, our defense budget is reasonable or pharmaceuticals, they're not, they're not corrupt because that's a lie. We both know they're very corrupt. I would argue that the Trump administration is not the right approach to, not the right, not the right person to handle that. First off, RFK thinks psychedelics, you know, cause gun sh- cause mass shootings. He thought AIDS was just used so the pharmaceutical company can, you know, make money's medicine. Tell me if all you said you want. He's an anti-vaxxer. You know, he's he's numerous times said he's not that, though. You know, autism. He's not. There's he's an anti-vaxxer. Yeah, I can send you some interviews where he's said different. Um, so I, I'm not. If a you want to play that game, game, you're going to lose, brother. <laughs> well, I won't go there. Bring your bigger fish to fry, but I will send you. I will. I will send you videos. Where go he's, for it. Yeah. yeah send. You know, and I'll hey. send you a hundred, a hundred times that that says. Anyway, go, go ahead. Keep, keep going. Anyway, my yeah. point stands that I'm not a fan of RFK. I don't think he should be handling our health industry. We can disagree on that if you'd like. Um, but I mean, also, like, there was a lot of corruption in the Trump administration. You know, I mean, hell, they, they, the Saudis, you know, broke, you know, Kushner a check for a billion dollars. You know, Trump had a Chinese bank account. Like, I'm not, these are not people that, you know, I mean, foreign dignity, oh, you know, foreign diplomats, everybody else were buying, you know, hotel rooms with huge markups in Trump hotels, right? So these are things he did not divest from his business that as every other president in history has. I mean, these are just small, these are things that I, I do not trust Trump to be a straight shooter. I just don't. I do not trust him to clean up, drain the swamp. As he said, he had four years to do it. Uh, the swamp got swamped. That's his biggest weakness. That's his biggest swamp weakness by here, far. Right? Yeah. Oh, I'm not, I, I do not trust him. And the, th- the reality is I'm not going to sit here and say, talk about like, oh, Trump's a dictator or he's a democracy. I'm not going to go down that road. But I will say this, just because the Democrats have made, will make incremental changes, such as capping insulin costs, such as the chip sack, where they bring in, they spend a ton of money to bring in, you know, chip infrastructure, such as, you know, the infrastructure bill, where they're repairing bridges, stuff like that. This is not sexy. It's not massive changes, but it's incrementally in the right direction. Um, whereas, I mean, history is littered with people that are upset, rightfully so because of corruption, because of mass media, and are looking for somebody different. And that person is much, much worse. And they're usually dictators. Again, I'm not saying Trump's a dictator, but I'm just saying, you know, how to like Mussolini or somebody get in power, or Putin, whoever. It's because people were sick of the establishment and sick of the corruption. So I just think we need to be really careful welcoming Trump with open arms just because he's something different. So my, so I, I fully understand that point. My rebuttal to that is that he was already in there for four years and he is not there now. For lack of trying. I mean, even Pence himself said, Hey, you know, I need Trump told him to overturn the election. He's definitely done some and said boneheaded shit when it comes to that for sure. Uh, like, I, like, I, he, he, he legitimately, I mean, you can argue all day. I'm not going to go to January 6th guy. I imagine we probably have different views on that. But the reality is, is he did not, I think we all agree. 
you know, people died and he did not exactly, you know, you know, storm the trenches trying to stop them just to put it lightly. And also, I mean, Pence himself said, Hey, you know, he told me to discount those elections and put it to Congress. He, he had multiple lawsuits that went through the courts and got shot down, thankfully. But again, this isn't because Trump didn't want it. This is because the system and the guardrails were strong enough to kind of repel that kind of behavior. Hans, did you want to say something? I, I saw you were thinking a few, I have a couple. Well, I'm just, I'm mostly still thinking about policy issues. You know, I, I think these talking points are ones that have been, you know, hashed and rehashed by everyone for, you know, four plus years. Um, and basically I think most people's positions on them are going to be whatever they are. And so they're going to hear yeah. this and, and kind of, you know, default back to what they are. So I guess I, I'm still curious though, how the, how do you see the, whether, okay, first I'll ask is, do you feel like Kamala Harris is in charge of the party or is like, are you voting for Kamala Harris, the president and her ability to be a leader? Or are you voting for the democratic party establishment and their ability to continue to, you know, provide results for the people, hopefully? So I think that's a key differentiator, to be honest, between the, the GOP and the Dems is that the GOP is Trump. Trump has hijacked the, the Republican Party like that. It is the MAGA party. I do not think that about the Democrats. I, I do not. I do not think that Kamala is an Obama figure or a Clinton figure that is the, the standard bearer of the party. I think she is very much a reflection of what the power brokers in that party want to do. I mean, so it's being straight that's, up. That's. Yeah, I mean it's it's hard to argue anything else, you know, looking at her. So what basically that is to say I expected that answer. So then the follow-on question is like why do you believe that the democratic establishment can provide you with results on the issues that you care about, you know, and like what are the examples that you're um you're basing that off of? I mean, just from a pure economic standpoint, Again, um, if you go back, so it, it's what has Trump done and what, and what he's talked about doing is the next term. Like, I mean, was that, there's that report the other day is 23 Nobel laureates. I am not an economics person. I do not have a degree in economics, but those Nobel laureates do. And he's talking about huge, you know, tariffs. All right. Tariffs would, the, the money would be passed down the t from the tariffs to the consumer. It would end up costing, I think it was like $4,000 or $5,000 for each person a year is what came out. And they all said that, ec that Kamala's economic plan is better than Trump's. Again, 23 Nobel laureates, you can say what you want about the system. I, I take them at their word and tariffs, if you look throughout history, has never worked. Like it just, it doesn't because you're not taxing the country, you're taxing the corporation. Um, and, and you know what they do? They don't, they don't say, oh, well, you know, well, they tax, they, they tax us on these, you know, um, tariffs, so we're just going to eat it to our stock brokers. No, they pass it on to the products and then the products become more expensive. So that's the first thing. Oh, I mean, if you look at the last four years of Biden. Can I throw something in there real quick though? Sure. But that, I, I think what's interesting about that is that it's not necessarily what, what the Democrat party will do in exchange is preventing Trump from doing that is a rationale for that specific it, issue. I believe that to be a bad policy. Okay. I just want to make sure that I understand that. So it's like, it's not so much that you're voting for the Democrat alternative. You're voting for the Democrats to ensure that doesn't happen. I, I think that my, my wallet in the country as a whole, whenever we get it, history has shown us time and again, when we get super isolationist things end poorly, that's just reality. So I I'm voting against that policy. Um, I'm also, I do like that Kamala wants to help out first time home buyers. You know, I do $20,000 tax credit, whatever it is. Whether she does that or not, who knows? 25, I think. I think it's a good policy. You know, we'll see if it happens, but I still think it's a good policy. I think it's better than the tariffs, you know? Um, it also, I mean, global politics, as you know, Z, is, uh, is important to me. And, you know, going to the Ukraine war, I think that Trump will sell out Ukraine on day one. I do. And I don't agree with that. And that's something I'll follow very closely. So that's another thing that takes, that I consider heavily. Uh, also, I mean, you talk about debt. I mean, Trump had $8 trillion of debt. He had $8 trillion of debt. So there's nothing 
that's that I've seen that's going to say in his next four years, he's going to like lower the national debt or anything like that. Um, so, I mean, you, you put it all together upon, on top of like the personal, just the fact that I think he's a trash person. You can agree or disagree. I just, from what, from listening to, listening to him talk, um, I do not agree with virtually anything he says. So you take that along with the economic policies, along with the foreign policies and you put together and yeah, I mean, the Democrats are not without their flaws, um, for sure whether it be corruption, whether I think they could do more economically, I think they could do more with healthcare, but at least it's at a glacial pace in the direction I want to go. I think the debt, the debt point, I, I, that's one of my biggest sticking points is that I don't think either party is going to do shit about the debt. That, that pisses me off. No, you're right. I mean, unless Elon gets his way and that's, you know, kind of the wild card in the, you can't help but make a massive impact on the long-term debt if he gets to, and like the reason that our debt is what it is, is because there are zero checks and balances on the government to force it to be accountable, effective, and efficient. And, you know, I, I think that for me, I vote for Trump, like even if RFK had been on the ballot, I would have specifically voted for Trump over RFK, even though I much preferred RFK as a candidate on the vast majority of issues, because really at the end of the day, I end up being a single issue voter. And that is government, like the bloat in the federal government needing to be reined. Like we need a good federal government. It needs to be effective. Like we need regulation. I'm not for complete deregulation either. Um, but it needs to be probably 10 to 20% of the size that it is today. And I don't have high confidence that that is what's going to happen under a Trump administration at, you know, with the help of Elon, but there's at least a chance and all of the, the policy positions that you're espousing, Keith, I like, I think that in each and every case, there is like Harris offering 25% assistance to home buyers, for example, or, you know, a lot, a lot of their solutions to help people are solutions that by default assume that the federal government gets a little bit bigger to help accomplish whatever that thing is. And like, I am fundamentally opposed to every single one of those inching, creeping expansions of the federal government. And, and so, like I said, that's really my, my single issue in this election. And just the possibility that Elon can address that one issue to me is is worth the vote for Trump, even though I like do I think disagree with him on on a number of things. So help me understand because this is something I, I would like to get your view on here. Help me understand how Elon would do that because for me, when I see this, I see Trump cutting taxes for corporations down to 17 percent, which in the fifties it was damn near like 80, 90 percent. I, I, oh, I seriously, seriously doubt he's going to add any tax on billionaires or anything of that nature. You know, so we're, so we're losing money. Like, like they're, they're going to cripple, they're going to kneecap the IRS. The Dems have done more to fund the IRS to kind of grab those tax cheats and hold them to account. Um, I mean, I'll get a small, you know, drop in the bucket ultimately, but at least they're trying. They've got a few hundred million, maybe a billion, whatever it is. So. How would, so that when I look at the new, you know, if I look, when I look at a Trump administration, that's what I see. I see additional debt. I see additional mm -hmm. corruption from, uh, well, from you're talking the, about the revenue side. I'm talking about the expenditure side. And that's really the biggest, like we're growing our deficit so quickly right now. And it's not a, a function of not bringing in enough tax revenue. It's a function of well overspent. You know, it's like a millionaire who, who, or even someone who brings in a million dollars of revenue a month, but they're spending $2 million a month. And so the fact that they have a giant income stream doesn't change the fact that they're going bankrupt faster than, you know, they can shake a stick. And that's really the, the position that our federal government is in is we have to address spending. We have got to, it's not just, you know, the, the department of defense is a great example that you can look at just because it's kind of obvious. Like when they're, I saw something the other day where they're spending 83 times um, the like 
normal store amount that you go to like Home Depot and you could buy a soap dispenser to put in your bathroom and like they commonly pay almost a hundred times that yeah, for the same thing. And, and obviously the reason for that is, you know, someone like there's a bunch of people who got greased palms in the process mm-hmm. of, sure. of that. And, and the way that this happens over time is that people are not held accountable for how they're spending money. And so I think we've got to like, I, I think that it's a scary scenario because i know that it's going to be super unpo- like everyone is going to hate elon musk is already you know super hated by a lot of people he's super loved by a lot of other people but there's he's going to be even more hated to like an extreme degree because this accountability is going to take money out of a lot of people's hands who have a very nice thing going for them and but if we can impose on all these like first of all cut a bunch of federal agencies that didn't even need to exist in the first place. Um, And then the ones that do need to exist, then we say, okay, we're going to do zero base budget. What is your mission? Okay. What do you need to do? You know, what do you need to accomplish that mission? Whatever you think it is, we're going to start you off with 10% of that. And we're going to force you to try and come up with as much results as possible. And then if we feel like you're actually making good progress, then we'll increase your budget. Uh, Those types of things are the types of things that need to happen. These are types of things that happen in functional businesses. These are not the types of things that normally happen in government. And it's going to be like, I know that it's basically offering Elon up to be a sacrificial lamb on the altar of this cause. And that scares me. But I also know that if we don't do something like that, that our children and our children's children are not going to live in America. They're going to live under a very unpleasant system um, because of the consequences of our irresponsibility fiscally. Yeah, I, th- I think what you're saying makes sense, but I think it's the wrong approach. And what I mean by that is you can't politically, you're not going to be able to go in and say, we don't like defending America. Like that's not going to play, right? Well, we don't have to not defend America. We just need, okay. Yeah. Sorry. What I, what I, what I think the approach you can do instead is say that we are stamping out corruption because that's what it is, right? You, you say, Hey, you know, you can, um, you have to track every single step and who is getting paid. Here is your budget. And you track that process end to end, which we can do. The Pentagon doesn't want to do it because everybody's getting paid, but we can do that. Right. And you're going to cut out probably half of the Pentagon budget right there, right? If you have a project that goes over more than once, there should be a law that you have to exit. There you go. That way, you're, I mean, I think the F-35 costs like 50 times more than what we wanted, right? Yeah. Which, which tells me either A, it's overpriced. That's not on accident. No, it's not. It's not. It's like, oh no, we're over budget. Well, what are we going to do? No. I mean, so, th- so I think you would you approach it that way. But, unfor- but unfortunately, I think also if you do that, you also have to do a lot of things that GOP courts, if we're being honest, allowed, like um, Citizens United, where you can just dump unload ungodly amounts of you know money into campaigns. That's got to go. You 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 know, term limits. That's got to go, or, or that's got. I'm sorry, that's got to be added. Um, and thirdly, on top of that, there was a law. They got snuffed out. I think during the Bush administration, I could be wrong, where you couldn't, you, you couldn't have a government job for X number of years after you're in private industry. Like yeah. that needs to be reinstalled, right? Like it should be 10 years. If I'm a CEO of a company and I'm a stockholder, I should not have a government job. Furthermore, anybody that has a government job should not be able to trade stock and their spouse should be able to trade stock. I'm not talking Wonderful. about like some analysts. I'm talking yeah. about the decision makers. Right. Keith, you've yeah. just said like the most incredible list of stuff that I think all of us want to happen. Here, here is my confusion. Mm-hmm. This is where I'm like stuck. Okay. Sure. Given that the Democrat party is the maximum system party, right? Give meaning that, uh, yourself and other people are not really going to vote for comma. They're going to vote for the Democrat system, which is a maximum system party. And the system is the thing that's generating the corruption. It doesn't that, isn't it? 
isn't it a fair statement to say that regardless of what any of us think of Trump or Kamala or their administration, isn't it a much higher likelihood that what you just described will happen in a system that is not the system party, right? I By mean, default, if, if doesn't that mean better. that the Trump admin will have a better chance of actually making that change versus the Democrats? I mean, you can, I'm, I'm going to get flamed for this next comment. I can, I just, I'm going to get torched. Keith, by all here's here. a secret. You've probably already gotten torched a thousand times. <laughs> so have we. We're all, we're, no, no, but yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to drop the, the nuclear, <laughs> we all have. the nuclear bomb on you guys here, right? Like, honestly, you can say what you want about AOC. I don't know. You probably hate AOC, but if you listen to some of her things on corruption, like if it was something like that, I would absolutely vote for that. The reality is though, Trump's administration was by any nonpartisan measurement, one of the most corrupt administrations in United States history. So like the Fox is in the chicken hat coop and then we kicked him out. And then four years later, he's like, yo, I'm a different Fox now. I'm a vegan Fox. Oh, come on right in. No, like that's not how that works. <laughs> it, just because we have a, a he's a, a trans fox party does not mean yeah. that we're like you know what I want an even more garbage party. They're going to fix it. Like that's not that's not how it works. See, I think that that's where I disagree. This this is where I disagree, right? I think and and this is this is like something that I've come around on because I was on the camp, and this this goes back to the mainstream media point, right? And this this is I think mainstream media has created an environment in the United States. That they have been so bad at being truthful that you do not know what is actually true anymore. That's the huge problem, right? And so let me let me finish that the sorry, thought, right? Sorry. By yeah. default, no, you're fine. By default, what that means is that somebody like Trump is going to get more leeway than potentially he deserves. Let's just say that's that's a factual statement, okay? But sure. in in that world where nobody really knows what is actually happening because our our news system has been so bad at actually pushing the news. But given, given, given the fact that people from opposing aisles, political aisles, us three, right? We yeah. are, the three of us are in different places. We all agree that it's all fucked. Okay. Sure. By yeah. default, doesn't that mean that the, that the system is automatically not the right solution, regardless of what the other system is, right? And here's my rebuttal to that. Let's say Trump, let's say Trump is literally, he, he takes it to another level of corruption. Let's just assume that's correct, what you're saying. And let's assume he takes it even farther with the help of RFK, Tulsi, Vivek, Elon. They're all just going to turn this into a into a, a corporate billionaire heaven, and we're all going to be serfs under their system. Let's just assume that's the case. What is the likelihood that the American system actually allows that to happen, right? Higher than it was four years ago. Okay. But so my rebuttal to that, my rebuttal to that, and this is going to sound crazy to some people. I actually but this is strongly like agree with that statement, but we'll, we can yeah. come back. To yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so where I'm at with this math, and this is a, this is like the times that we live in now. This is like, this is what's so unfortunate about this conversation. Okay. The math I'm trying to figure out, given that I'm not happy with the system whatsoever, and there's no way I'm voting for the system. The math I'm trying to figure out is what is it statistically more likely that the Trump campaign will actually make change, positive change, or that they will turn this into the worst possible outcome, right? And given that legacy media has lied a lot about a lot of things, including Trump, okay, I am, I am leaning towards the change. And that's unfortunate, right? Because I could have never in a thousand times pictured myself in this scenario. But when I have people that I personally trust in a not maximally trust, but there are people that I've tracked their their record and I see positive change and a significant number of these people are picking one side versus the other. And the people that I have a lot of disrespect for and contempt for, aka the neocons like Dick Cheney, etc., they're choosing the other side, that's signal to me, right? And it, it's impossible for me to ignore that. Okay, okay, so Dick Cheney, first of all, no Democrat likes Dick Cheney. Dick Cheney... And by proxy, Liz Cheney, you know, not father, can't hold for Mom, father's sins, whatever. Like just fine. Kamala yeah. loves him. <laughs> Kamala. Well, you know why? <laughs> because there is about a six, the estimate is about six to 12% of the populace, populace is legitimately undecided right now. And most of those people are Republicans that like Republican policies, but do not like Trump. And frankly, you know, the Cheneys, uh, you know, deal with the devil kind of situation. You know, they can help get some of those votes. It's a political calculation. It's nothing less. That's just the reality. Dick Cheney, Liz Cheney will not have a place in a, in a You're Harris making my point. 
but you're making my point. My point is that the party is acting in the exact same way that has gotten us to this mess where all it's three no of us different. agree that it's a mess. It's no right? different than RFK or Elon using Trump. Like, it's no different. Like, I mean, politics makes strange bedfellows. It just is what it is, right? I mean, there are they're leaked Trump, they're leaked RFK, um, you know, text that, that he's calling Trump a terrible person and less than But human. Keith, I but mean, Keith, here's the difference. Here's the difference. Like, this is, this is where I, I have, quantifiable evidence that shows that like this is this is why it's different liz cheney dick cheney etc kill people okay tesla or elon musk rfk right rfk cleaned up the hudson river he's helped a bunch of people win cases for health cases right elon musk has is actually moving the world towards a more sustainable world which is an amazing democrat sort of thing that they've been trying to push, we have quantifiable, quantifiable evidence, however flawed they are and however crazy they might be, they are moving society forward, whereas people like Cheney and neocons are literally killing people. This, this is like, this is my no, moral. This no, is like, yeah, I mean, like, look, not, I'm not, I'm not directly. Concerned. I don't want to say they actually, uh, this is, the, I just no, want to make sure. Here, if you think I was here, no, no, no. Cheney yeah. and Mott. Like, no. are you going back to those what I'm trying to? But like. I just want to be very clear. What what I'm trying to say is that they perpetuated a system that forced the United States to go overseas to kill innocent people. That's just that's just factually true, right? And so, like, it's a, and that is the moral thing that I'm stuck on, right? As as a, as a terrible person as Trump might be, as evil that that he might be, right, et cetera, et cetera. Where, like, that's that's where I'm stuck. It's like, okay, cool. You can say all those things. He's incompetent, and he has bad policies. So that's what you I'm can stuck, say. Right? But you can say all those things, right? You can say all those things, but just track the record of the people that are actively backing each candidate. This is when RFK. I, I, I told you, I'm not a fan of RFK. Tulsi, I don't really know much about. I don't really. I mean, whatever. Cool. I mean, Tulsi. <laughs> but you don't. Do you don't like RFK because of what he says, not because of what he's done? I mean, he's done some good things. With like microplastics, with the Hudson stuff like that, well, um, but I just do not. I mean, I've heard him in interviews talking about again, like autism and and spreading right. straight up misinformation or lies. And you, don't do like like you don't like what he says. You don't like what he says. You don't like what he says. Yeah, I don't. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Here, straight up. Um. So, you know, so that's my thing with him. As far as Elon, I think we we talked about it. Like, I agree with what. You know, I grew from a biz business Elon. I love, I'll go to the map with business Elon. I've got a stock, but political Elon, not so much. And, and while mainstream media is corrupt and has an agenda and is in the back pocket of the government and the power brokers have been for decades, Pharma. I'll tell you this, like Elon lies all the time too. Like he does like it. You can't just, be, just because everyone's flawed. It, yeah. But I mean, Trump, Trump has 30,000 confirmed lies. That's all he does is lie. So, I mean, so I'm not, so you can't sit here and say, oh, well, the mainstream media is corrupt. So then we should, you know, then we should, we should hire, you know, this guy who's lied 30,000 times and is taking money from the Saudis and is taking money from, you know, God knows yeah. who else and has one of the most corrupt administrations in history. Like that's not the solution. But it, so, so my rebuttal to that is the record of the people that are actually part of each administration. Because, because, because what you just said, I can make the same exact point about the Democrats continually lying about things that Trump has said to try and rile up their base, well, find people, bloodbath, et cetera, et cetera. Just objectively false things where they're trying to paint this person as a racist, as a bigot, right? And you can actually go see the videos and I, I'm not going to sit here and say it's true or not. You can just watch the video and it's false. And so like the thing that the Democrats are getting themselves into is that they're trying to espouse these like high, like high morality and like they're like the good people, but they're literally doing the same exact thing that they're blaming the Trump campaign for, which is lying. They're lying too. So th that's, so when I hear that argument of like, this is the most lying, like this guy has lied so much, it's like, okay, great. The other people have to. And if yeah, we're in a two party I, system, what am I supposed to decide on? I, I think I think track record's probably a good one. <laughs> well, but okay, if you want to go by track record, yeah. again, like Trump was a terrible president, you know? Um, Based on what measure? Like how how do you come to that conclusion? Well, if you want well, I mean if you want to go debt, he right, you know, he had he had eight point seven trillion dollars in debt. If you want to go, I profoundly disagree with the tax cuts. That's another one. Um he told, you know, I mean, he was I, I thought that his handle handling of COVID, for all you can say what you want about the mainstream media, I thought his handling of COVID was 
I mean, I have a biology degree. I'm not a doctor, but I do know how things work. And, you know, telling people, I mean, just whether it be the press conferences or just so sowing disinformation, I, did, I was not a fan. And the corruption. I mean, just, and this is just off the top of my head. It's been four years. I mean, he's, if you look at any nonpartisan source, he has one of the most corrupt, you know, administrations in history, period. I mean, everybody just, Virtually everybody he's been associated with has gone to jail or it's a felony. And the ones that don't hate him and have come out. I mean, you look, you can say what you want about John Kelly or about, you know, Bob Woodward. I mean, he, you know, he, um, you know, revealed Watergate. He has been tough on all presidents. You know, he, he's come out with a lot of damning stories. He's, if there's a journalist out there you can trust, it's Bob Woodward. Um, I mean, talking to Putin seven times since he's got an office. Having files. You can say what you want. Maybe they're lying to us, but I don't think there should be classified information in this, you know, golf motel there. I just don't. Um, there's just a, a I mean, you could, you could go on and on. I'm not going to sit here and espouse every single Trump scandal. I'd be here yeah. all day. So, but. so one of the things that I'm noticing, uh, Keith, tell me that this is fair. So when we're talking about like what, what I hear a lot right yeah. now from your side, tell me if this is fair or not, is that you, you, you just dislike Trump so much. That you can oversee or overlook a lot of the failings on the Democrat side, and then that and that's why you're voting for the Democrats. It's it's like like tell me if this is an accurate statement. You are voting against Trump more than you're voting for the Democrats. Is that correct? I would say yes, but I would argue that you guys are doing the same thing. Are you voting for more for Trump, or are you voting more against the establishment? I think so, we're just two sides of the same coin here. Yeah, f from from my standpoint, I mean, you you can definitely make an argument. I think from my standpoint is I think the, and we, we talked about this, the Trump side has a higher likelihood chance of driving change than the Harris side. And that's why I'm considering voting for Trump because yeah. there's a higher likelihood chance for change. By default, I am voting for the not change party in my head, right? Because, but I am voting for change. I was, I, was, I was dead set on just either skipping or voting third party. I was. I was totally that set on, on, on not considering Trump. And the thing that's changed my mind slightly about Trump, I think, I think his, his media run has been very smart. Sure. I think going, going on the podcast run that he has, I think it's reaching a lot of people that traditionally would have either been disenfranchised or just, or just uh, on the fence. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think his reach there has been brilliant. And, and it's allowed, I think, someone like me to actually get to hear the guy for who he is and let, and that, and I can make up my own mind. Right. I think yeah. that has worked for in his benefit tremendously. JD Vance getting out there and talking, I think has helped him tremendously. And like the pockets of, of the type of media he's going after, like th those are the ones I listen to. Mm -hmm. Like all the, like puck, anything that's not legacy media, I'm absorbing like a, like a sponge. Right. Sure. So, so from that perspective, it's allowed me to like, like, uncover a lot of these things that I've noticed with like the Tesla story or the Elon Musk story in the past mm -hmm. where I, I I've seen so, you know, in the last 12 years, we've been following the story. How many times has that company or person been, uh, just, just been in, in again, media just lying about these stories, right? Elon Musk is doing this and that, and this and that Tesla is doing this and that, and this and that. And because we're so close to the story, I'm like, false, 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 false. And then I see the same exact thing happening with Trump. Right. So that helps me like get to a point where I'm like, okay, so they might be lying about a lot of stuff about Trump too. Right. That I, that I, I had preconceived notions about, about the guy. Right. You know, I, yeah. Go ahead. You, you know, what's funny about that is what I'll, I'll say this. First of all, I'll say this about Trump. Trump is great to listen to. Like he's objectively funny. I don't think we're going to, you know, that he's charismatic. Which is why he's one of one when it comes to, you know, the bluster and everything else. What he, and he has a, he's, graded on a different scale than everybody else because he's, he's just an objectively funny person to listen to. I think, you know, I, I enjoy listening to Trump. I'll, I'll be the first to admit it. I don't believe anything he says, but I, I enjoy listening to him. Um, so yeah, so that's, anyway, that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is I think that the democratic parties, one of the things that drives me insane about them is they are trash at marketing themselves. And they are also trash at focusing on the right things with Trump. Like they say all these different things about Trump. They focus on all these things. Like they focused on his massive square garden thing the other day. 
I think it was a bad idea for Trump, but not for the reasons that they pointed out. I don't, you know, like, are you going to focus on a comedian? No, I don't think you should do that. And what it does is it's like the yeah, better don't hire don't hire a roast comedian and then be mad when they roast it. <laughs> well, well, it's just it's just a grow fast. I mean, frankly, that's he it was red meat to his base, and he's already got those votes locked up. Like, why are you feeding red meat to your base? They, they they're full, bro. Like, you don't need it. Like, you need to. He needed a softer side to appeal to those undecided like women in the Republican Party, for instance, and he did not do that. Whereas Kamala came out to her credit and she, you know, she gave a speech and she talked about how, you know, how she makes mistakes and how she's going to learn from those. And I think that humility is something that Trump would never do would helped her. So again, I, so I don't, I just think it was a bad idea. I think the approach for Trump in the last week before the election is not the correct, it's not politically smart in my opinion now, but the, but the Democrats, because they're dumbasses. And particularly the, you know, the mainstream media is like, oh my God, they got a roast comedian. They called Puerto Rico an island of trash, blah, 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 blah. When there's so many other things that they could nail Trump on. Like there's so many other things they could nail Trump on. And then they focus on just the, the low hanging fruit, right? I mean, he literally said that, you know, immigrants poison the blood of our, you know, of, of our, um, you know, society. He literally said there needs to be some kind of punishment for when they get abortion. Like that's, that's a verifiable clip. You know, they could focus on yeah. things like that, but instead they're like, oh, well, they got a roast comedian. So they just consistently just fall for his bait all the time. And what it turns into is kind of like an us, Uncle Fester's nail in the bed kind of thing where like one nail could kill you, but you've got 4,000 nails. So he turns into Teflon Dawn. So it's just ridiculous. Hans, did you want to jump in? We've been hogging up the conversation here. Yeah, sorry, Hans. I mean, the the thing that I've been thinking about is disproportionate. I, I guess I agree that corruption is a huge problem. And I, I think we see this one very differently. Um, but I I think that people like Matt Taibbi and Glenn Greenwald, who have been, you know, pretty well respected left leaning journalists for a long time, when they come out and they identify a bunch of corruption with the United States government specifically working to censor the voices of Americans through putting pressure, using non-government agencies on companies, uh, social media companies in general, to you know further overwhelmingly the agenda of the Democrats. Whether you want to look at the the Hunter Biden laptop story or um, just, you know, general COVID censorship, deplatforming of people like Jay Bhattacharya at a time when we need actual scientists to figure out COVID instead of just like, there is no single bigger purveyor of COVID misinformation and disinformation than Anthony Fauci and the CDC and the WHO. And the fact that none of those people are being held accountable, like, you know, I, I just have a hard time. I don't think that Trump's corruption even, which I agree is there. I don't think it even begins to hold a candle to this establishment systematized version of corruption that is animating the Democratic Party right now. And that like, that's where I have a really difficult time. Like, just, yeah, overall. I don't, yeah, I mean, I don't know. For me personally... As far as Fauci goes, I mean, he's been there for what, 40 years or whatever the hell it was. Um, I don't think that he woke up one morning with COVID like, this is my opportunity to, to consistently lie. I mean, I, I don't know about, you know, some of the examples you're thinking of in your head, but for me, I mean, COVID was a new, they called it the novel coronavirus at the time for a reason. As a result, you're going to be wrong and you're going to consistently learn. Now, where the media screwed up, is they took everything as absolute fact when people don't understand nuance in society, frankly, and that they should have said, this is what we believe to be true at this moment, instead of this is exactly what is true. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know how much of that's absolute corruption. And a lot of that's just, we're still learning as we go and trying to make policy off of half-baked information. Well, I would say that you're giving the system a huge benefit of the doubt where I don't 
think that it's justified. And I, I say that as someone who, like I worked in the cleaning industry all throughout COVID and I got to witness firsthand the safety theater that we were engaging in, like telling, specifically telling my clients, we can perform this service for you to do the sanitizing and that sanitizing. But the thing that we're facing right now is an airborne virus and I can sanitize all the desks in the world as many times as you want. It's not going to change the number of people that get sick in your establishment one little bit. And they're like, yeah, we know we don't care. Just come in and do it anyways. Our employees will feel better and we're going to get government money to pay for it. And we're going to pay out the nose to have it, even though we know that it's doing literally zero. And this was like common. And this is just like one example of something that when I then looked, I started recognizing that pattern going on all over the place. And then from there, when I have, you know, listened to Matt Ridley uh, is a a biologist, an evolutionary biologist, a prolific writer. um, And he's one that I, I would definitely suggest listeners look into. He's been following for many years the the origin story of covid and the what seeming to be the inside cover up by the NIH and the CDC on the fact that this was almost certainly a lab leak you know it's not 100% conclusive but it's like 90 some plus percent likely covid was the result of a lab leak that origi- originated there in Wuhan And we still can't even hold the people who told us that absolutely was not the case responsible for the fact. And even though we got email chains that show, yeah, they they actually knew it was and they were kept trying to avoid FOIA requests. And, you know, we're trying to keep electronic communications about this from even existing. And yet you can still find lots of evidence that they knew this at the time. And like I said, this is just one, you know, one area where whatever Trump's corruption is, I don't think it has even a fraction of the real world day to day negative impact on global citizens lives that 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 has. So I would say that, first off, I agree with you. I do think it's overwhelmingly likely it was probably a lab leak, to be honest. And the reason that it's probably covered up from a government perspective is that it would cause all sorts of problems in China. And that's a very complicated relationship. I'm not justifying it. I'm just saying that's in all likelihood, that's just the reality. You you start, you start accusing the second largest economy in the world of, you know, lab leaking of, you know, global pandemic that causes a lot of issues. That's just reality, right? I would also say that your cleaning story is stupid and that the government or any business says, Never let a good crisis go waste, go to waste, right? And Hans is no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the way you said it made it sound like Hans is stupid. <laughs> Your yeah, story is stupid. Hans, uh, cut that out. <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, yeah, so and I do think that some of the policies were absolutely stupid and should not be implemented. But overall, I do believe that most of the pandemic policies probably saved thousands of lives, as stupid as they were. And while a lot of them were redundant and, and not necessary, there were some that we implemented that probably saved thousands of lives. And again, I'm not justifying the cover up, but you know, understand probably why it happened. And the government, for all its flaws, still mostly made up of experts that don't aren't politicians. They just live their everyday lives, right? Um, thanks. I got to I got a PR right back. Oh. <laughs> So I, I will say that, and I will also say that as far as corruption goes, if you look at some of the most corrupt decisions of the last decade, it's usually come from the Supreme Court and Trump has appointed most of that court. So I hold him accountable for that, whether that be Citizens United, whether that be the decision that says a president cannot be held accountable for any how, official acts. How um, can you hold? accountable for citizens united when that was a decision that was made before he was president like I don't understand okay that's that. a good point point is it's still it's still the heritage you're talking society. just about the gop in exactly general. it's still the you know. i mean it's still the heritage of society right i mean he made that trump made that deal with the new republican power brokers hey i will get you court 
justices if you support me, right? Um, but I mean that, but uh, the Chevron decision, which you can agree or disagree with, um, you know, you but you've got that Citizens United again, the whatever the King decision was there. Um, there's lots. They've slowly chipped away. I, I look, I'm a guy. I'm a white dude, so I'm not huge on abortion one way or the other. But white dudes for Harris. White dudes for Harris. Baby. <laughs> but I mean, I do agree with all those decisions. So just overall, I, I think there was what was there was a court decision. I don't know the name of it, so I don't want to sound so. You know, you can fact check me on this, but there was some Supreme Court decision that basically said that. To, I think it was with your 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 great state of Texas Senator Ted Cruz, actually, the growth of Ken Cruz. Ken Cruz, baby, Ken Cruz. Uh, where he tried to loan um where he tried to loan him his own campaign money and didn't have to pay it back. Or his campaign loaned him money and didn't have to pay it back. Yeah. The court said like that's cool, whatever. So my again, my rebuttal to that. So I think I think going down the list of how one side acts in a corrupt manner. Mm -hmm. I can create the same exact list for the other side. I would argue that right. the Supreme Court, the Robert Supreme Court, is the most corrupt Supreme Court, certainly in my lifetime. Um, How do you define corrupt? I mean, citizens, you know, they I make mean, decisions you don't like. No, whenever, whenever you have, whenever you make it easier for special interests to influence our political system, whenever you make it easier for for powerful individuals to avoid accountability, whenever you make it harder. For normal people's voices to be heard, to me that is corruption. Yeah, and, Robert, and the Roberts Court has done all those things. So you're talking about specifically about Citizens United. Well, I mean that's one of them. How about the decision yeah. where they said anything that um, Trump or a president does in an official manner can't be, you know, tried. He, he's he's immune from prosecution. To me, that's corrupt. To me, um, uh, if you have Ken Cruz get loans from his super PAC and you don't have to pay it back. That's just a straight up bribe yeah. at that point. To me, that's corrupt, right? Uh, I mean, the Voting Rights Act, they've consistently chipped away at that, made it easier and easier to, to block votes. You know, and we yeah. can talk about voting all day. To me, that's corrupt. And it just goes on and on. I mean, those yeah. are, it, it, that's, that's what they do. They say, hey, you know, we are for people with influence and we are against the middle class people. Yeah. I think, I think all of this sort of culminates to that. One of the initial points is like, you you said, which is, you don't think that drastic change can happen with one administration. You have to chip away at it, mm -hmm. and your justification is the Democrats are closer to the values that I want projected onto the United States, and and thus I'm going to vote for the administration that will uphold those values and chip away at those values within within the confines of the current system. And try to make small improvements every single year. Is to that me, a fair that is the only approach you can take without yeah. starting a civil war or something? To be honest with you, um, with our with the way our current system is structured, whether it be healthcare, education, you know, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. defense. So the budgets. depressing thought about that. The depressing thought about that is that at some point it's going to get so corrupt that everything's going to be divorced by, from the will of the people, unless you have drastic change. And I think my rebuttal to that is that although i think it is it is a possibility that this country is already at a point where if drastic change is made shit will go sideways quick and that that's a scary thought in my in my mind and if we keep going the route that we're going by continually supporting the system i think we end up at that point regardless at some point and Possibly. so in my I head you know i think i think it's i think it is absolute certainty I think it's an it's a hundred percent ninety nine point nine nine percent certainty that if this continues this path of polluting the debt, which every single party has done since two thousand, mm -hmm. I know Trump added a bunch to the to the federal uh, debt the 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 deficit, but literally every president since two thousand has been going crazy adding to the deficit. Okay, uh, as long as we keep continually creating this weird marriage between pharma and government and the military industrial complex and the government, right? The, this has only one place where it can go, where it's like, it just gets so big and so corrupt and so crazy. That's like 90% of our money goes to the government and the government gets to do whatever it wants with it. And the government's going to be an elite few of people that have relationships between the government and the bodies that control the country. And they're going to end up winning, whatever that means. So like, to me, that is the ultimate outcome of this path. And so the, the question becomes, 
the alternate path of trying to take a hammer to it, right? Are you still there, Keith? Your your picture's froze. I want to make sure you're still there. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you and see you. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, sorry so, about that. I'm not sure what happened. No there. problem. The, the train I was on is that I think I think if if this is the system, which in this case I view as a Democrat party, continues on its path, that end point is guaranteed of just bad, of just totally bad. If we keep supporting that system. Whereas on the flip side is if and again the, the the challenge is trusting that trump is the hammer that's a, a, a good hammer that's that's the that's the order that's the that's the step that i have to go through to say yes but when again when he gets backed by people that i've seen make good ch positive change and they're going out of the way to support him that gives me a little bit of signal that says maybe he is the hammer and he just didn't have the right tools around them in 2016 to make it happen but that's that's a that's a tough one to to like land on, but that's where I'm leaning, to be completely honest. Because again, in my head, the math is, what's the statistical likelihood that the Democratic Party is, go is gonna do that? To me, it's near zero. What is the chance that the Trump party could do that? Definitely above zero. And so, is that how I'm gonna vote? Yeah, Probably, I mean, I don't, honestly. Well, there's nothing that I've heard Trump say in 10 years, or do, or anything in his administration that gives me any confidence whatsoever that he is that hammer. That's just my What second. if there was a hammer? Like, what, what would that hammer look like? Do, do you want that hammer? Is that a hammer? Uh, like, are yeah. you seeking for a hammer? I would love a hammer, but honestly, I, I think that hammer and Hans is probably going to log off just on principle here. But of, but I mean, to me, that hammer would probably come from the left because in this country, if you look like an AOC, I don't, or, or something like that, I don't, they're, if you, if you look anywhere else in the world, they're moderates. It's just here, they're far left, right? Um, I, I think that the corruption needs to be stomped out. The, the government needs to be reworked, but the government does have, does do a good job of being a barrier when it's working effectively as a, a wall to businesses, worst impulses. And that is crazy unregulation, you know, environment, you know, disaster, in, in, environmentally environment disaster, a horrible healthcare system where the middlemen get all the education or all the money, a horrible ed education system where the colleges are just basically operating like businesses. So that, that's kind of where I'm at with that. Uh, I would go, I, I do want to point something out for what I just heard Z is that I would argue that the current trajectory that we were on right now started in the Reagan administration. It just got worse. Right. And that is the, that we're in a second gilded age right now. And that the cost of living versus what the cost of living continues to go up. Whereas your standard employee income stays the same. Not only that, but so, I mean, not only that, but, um, again, again, the, you know, the wealthiest 1% is consistently disconnected from the rest of society. And I think that's a, that is a huge issue. Um, I think a lot of that is from the new technologies. I mean, the first gilded age was oil, steel, um, you know, banking with JP Morgan that caused that massive wealth gap. And now we have a new industrial evolution with the internet with AI, with whatever, you know, whatever these new technologies coming out where again, it has caused an opportunity for the 1% and the entrepreneurs, a select few to make themselves insanely wealthy at the cost of, you know, poor peasants like myself. What makes you, what, what makes you feel like it's at the cost of the, the population? I mean, look at, I mean, just look around. I mean, there you what's your, what's your average household income in 1990 versus 2020 or 2024. But I want to understand how are entrepreneurs directly responsible for that environment? Like how are they directly res responsible for keeping society down? I just wish, well, I did, I'll be honest. I did not think we would go down this path. So I want to be careful here. But you best be careful, son. No, but I will <laughs> say when you have, when you have very weak when you have very weak unions and things of that nature, you can vastly ramp up work hours. You can vastly ramp up production. When you have see, when you have entrepreneurs and CEOs that have that can influence the government and you know get as much efficiency as possible, as they would put it, you're you're going to mean, that's exactly what you're going to get. But a lot of times, it's at the cost of your normal your normal individual. Again, like living wage wages hasn't gone up. The forty hour work week is dead. I don't know anybody that works 40 hours, except for maybe you. I know a lot of people that work a lot less. 
<laughs> what you do? Everybody else here. <laughs> work from home. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I mean, even work from home, like, okay, you got 8 a.m. meetings, uh, and then you work at 11 o'clock at night. You never really get off the clock, right? That's free hours. Um, salary wages. I, I mean, union unions and workers' rights have been chipped away at over the years. So, okay. Hans, I saw you pulled up a, uh, a graph. I think Hans might yeah, be more I mean, prepared than you are, Keith. <laughs> well, this is just one that I had to Google real quick. I, I would agree that we need, so we need competition. And there's a couple of different ways that organizations can insulate themselves from competition and, you know, basically have either monopoly power or oligopoly power and become super extractive. And I, I'm totally against, you know, super extractive organizations, um, whether they be corporations or government entities. And I feel like we have the, like the biggest it's crony capitalism. That is what, you know, we, I think we would both agree that we're against when you can utilize the power of a regulator or a state agency of some sort, or just, you know, your overall size in the market to employ, anti-competitive tactics like that's pretty lame that's every it, industry it just, though <laughs> well it's no it that is actually not true which is why i brought this chart <laughs> for me an industry help educate me hans all right here we go you have to so, promise not to cry once you're educated keith okay oh jeez. i'm wary if i cry all the time this is just <laughs> a number of different industry sectors and their costs since yeah 1998 and i think uh it ends in 2018 so just 20 years worth of data and Mm -hmm. you're basically tracking inflation and so there's a number of sectors of the economy where there's inflation and then there's some other sectors of the economy where there's deflation and i think you know one of the things that stands out about the overall group. So the ones that get more expensive, the worst one is hospital services. Shocking. Um, and then college tuition being way up there in college textbooks, you know, textbooks, tuition, either way, college. Childcare. Being, yeah, the second most. Then, yeah, childcare, medical services. Then you do have average hourly wages. They, um, is It has been growing, but not nearly as fast mm-hmm. as child care, hospital services. Uh, Housing is a little bit better than hourly wages, but not by a lot. And I think that since 2018, this has changed. I think if you were to continue this chart, housing would quickly outpace uh, hourly wages. And then food and beverage is probably the same thing. Those have gotten a lot more expensive. But then in other areas, cars, household furnishings, clothing, cell phone services, computer software, toys, and TVs, we have actually either flat to deflation and like obviously no one cares about how cheap the tv is overall but it i think computers computer services and tvs these are an area where we have allowed competition really to run free and we haven't picked winners um, you know, I think hospital services, the reason that that is so much more expensive today is because it's so heavily regulated. And here's where I'll go into speculation. I think that there's causes here, and, but not necessarily that it's the type of corrosive corruption that we have been discussing where like there's bad people with bad motives who are out to make this like way more expensive just so that they can make more money off of us. I think that one of the big causes of like hospital service really increasing in costs is that the regulatory environment around it is so complicated that there, well, a combination of the regulatory environment being so complicated and then the Obamacare, you know, healthcare for all act, like everything has gotten way more expensive in healthcare since then. That's beautiful fact. Um, But the, when it's that complicated to navigate regulations and there are that many lawyers who can make that much money on various yeah. aspects of it, then that's where things get a lot more expensive and, and giving lawyers leeway to to grift off of the system. And I'm 
not saying that Trump is motivated to reduce things, but I think this is an area where you, you do see the size of government and the size of regulations that get put in place make things more expensive. So if you can identify for me the uh, government agencies that are in charge of regulating computers and TVs and that those are the same size as hospital services, college tuition, uh, those types of things, then I think we'll have a, a good point of discussion. Bring that chart back up. I love this chart. Thank you, Hans. It's a fantastic chart. So, for, okay, so you got me excited now. Sorry, I got a little hot on this caller here. So first off, a few things, the reason why there's some deflation or some flat. If you look at this, cars, you know, clothing, cell phone, toys, whatever, these are all industries that have multiple competitors, particularly cars on a global scale, yep. right? It's also technology that's gotten cheaper over time. Like, I mean, creating a 70-inch TV today versus creating a 70-inch TV in 1990 with the big thing in the back and take the three of us and four other dudes to move out of a room, you know, uh, that's... You know, that's the technology got significantly cheaper. Um, so that's that's the second reason. Um, because why doesn't that technology why doesn't that technology apply to hospitals? Because I guarantee, like, hold on, because I got my that brings me into my third reason, which is the most important reason by far is that these are elastic goods, these are not goods that are critical. If I if my TV breaks, I am not going to die, you know. And TVs are a nice to have, you know, toys are a nice to have, right? These, these are elastic goods. Um, whereas if I break my leg, the doctor's like, pay up, bro, or you're screwed, right? Like that's, that's the reality. Um, as far, you know, as far as the, I'll, I'll use the health hospital services here. There's a couple of reasons why they're so insanely expensive compared to the rest of the world. Um, I, I'll give you an example. I have a friend who has a diabetes drug, diabetes drug. They're paying like four grand a month for this drug, right? Just the drug. That's it. It's, it's like, I want to say it's like $150 a dose in Canada. Just like stupid, right? And the reason for this, many, um, for many things, but you brought up the Obamacare. I want to talk about that. I actually did a project where Obamacare first came out. And one of the big things about Obamacare that nobody talks about is before Obamacare, there, everything was all like the old paper pads and you had like the doctor scribble and you couldn't read anything. Right. And nothing, and nothing was synced up. Nobody could communicate from one doctor to another. The biggest thing that Obamacare actually did was make electronic all of the old systems and sync up all the old systems, which is actually vastly improved efficiency. The biggest problem with the hospital services is that we have insurance that is negotiating with each individual person. So they can basically say, Hey, it's the middleman, just like every other corrupt thing in history, right? They can say, Hey, Hans, you want to buy that drug? Let's talk about it. You can buy it for $5,000 or you can not buy it at all. Whereas you have everywhere else in the developed world, hell, even South, my wife's from South Africa, even they've got some kind of government healthcare that's significantly cheaper to help out, you know, the middle class and poor. Um, they say, hey, we're going to negotiate on behalf of everyone here. So it's not like they're getting rid of the pharmaceutical companies or getting rid of our technology. They're just, the government's negotiating on the bad of everyone, which drastically drives down prices. And frankly, if it was up to me, we would cut out every middleman. It would be the pharmaceutical company, a doctor that would be completely separate, and then you through a government plan or, or yeah, whatever. That sounds like a free market. Exactly what we don't have when it comes to healthcare. No, it's just crap. It's just it, it's just cutting out the garbage, the garbage middlemen, and then in this case, I do think the government needs oh. to get, get more involved. I mean, the the reason that oh. these pharmaceutical companies are immune to competition is because the FDA makes sure that they have no competition. I mean, if it's up to me, I would trust bust all of them. I break up. I break Pfizer into a vaccine company i'd break it into a whatever you know a, a diabetes company i would break it into a million different companies kind of like they did with att back in the day um college you know college tuition i mean i would th i think there would be there should be a cap 
I mean, that's, this is what you get, particularly with state schools where they run it like business. I'm sorry. Government doesn't need to be run like, like, like a business. It doesn't. It's a government. But let me ask you this. College, college tuition is not, a, is not an elastic, it's an elastic good. It's not a necessary, not, right? Not, not necessarily. I mean, of course most, it is. most people, most well-paying jobs in America today, most require college education. Uh, are you sure about that? Well, that, or if you're, if you want to be a plumber or a trade school, which is where I'm going to push my kids, to be honest. How, how many, how many, or how many drivers? Software. Yeah. Or software. Right. But like how many, how many, uh, how many 18 wheeler drivers make more than your average college, uh, student nowadays or like, like net net worth by age 30, who's going to earn more the, the, the person that's driving a truck starting at age 18 or the person that went to college for four years and got a liberal arts degree and works at Starbucks. Well, they're both who's going to have a better life. And there's a lot of jobs like that, right? There's a lot of those. They're both going to be struggling financially. Only one's going to have $300,000 in debt. The other one's not. So by default, the one that doesn't have the debt is going to be better off. Truck drivers don't significantly. And and drug driving is going to be obsolete in the next decade anyway. Yeah. But the college degree person is already obsolete. They just wasted four years of their life with a giant debt load and they literally can't do anything with a degree. If it was, if it was me, I would, you know, I, I would su- significantly subsidize state schools, um, for STEM degrees for four years. We're talking doctors, engineers. Yeah. You want the government to be bigger. I mean, really hear me out here. You, you sub- you significantly subsidize STEM degrees for four years in state schools. So I'm not talking, I'm not calling for universal education, but where you really focus on doctors, engineers. Um, you know, mathematicians, physicists, whatever. If you want to get an underwater basketball basket weaving degree, if you want to get a theater degree, that's on you, right? But you subs- you know, but you, you would subsidize those, and then yeah, that's not actually growing government; that's reducing government. Because right now we're doing that plus all the other stuff. Well, right now we're handing out student loans to whoever wants one, and then they're paying, and then they're in debt the rest of their life because yep. as a society. We've been told that we have to get a college degree, which is you're trying to incentivize the areas of growth in the economy. We, we need to incentivize value add areas that we're getting crushed in places like that. Ch- places like China or Japan and Europe are crushing us in India. We need to incentivize that, and then we need to not make it a requirement for a college degree to get a, your standard blue collar job, in my opinion. But that's, I mean, that, that goes beyond monopolistic practices. I just, think. so I'm waiting for this like breakthrough moment where you blow our minds with that chart. Well, I mean, look, if you look at the, if you go back to the chart, <laughs> if you go back to the chart, healthcare, education is its own thing, but healthcare is monopoly, it has monopolistic practices. Um, 100%. Well, it's, uh, it's state sanctioned monopoly. Like the hospital in your area gets to be the hospital in your area. And but, but they, you got, you got Wellstar, you got Pfizer whatever you've got two or three players in each in healthcare period right um same with medical care services i mean and then you you want to talk about and virtually any other i mean there's a lot of things on here that are, that are monopolistic practice again groceries food and beverages down i i would it's significantly higher these days well no food, uh, food and beverage up through 2018 was basically keeping up with inflation only slightly higher but i would attribute that to Americans are just eating more and we have an unhealthy number of people. And that's what's driving a lot of the consumption. I mean, airlines is another, airlines is another thing, right? Yeah. I'm not monopolistic. Um, you know, telecom. So, but, but what, but your solution is for in the areas where there is high, where there is a really high prices, your solution is for the government to step in and start, um, setting rules to force prices down. Instead of allowing more competitors to come in, that rules to force prices down. I think that we should increase competition by breaking up monopolies and oligarch and oligopolies. That's what I think. Okay. And then in situations like healthcare, in situations like college education, I think there needs to be policies in place that we've talked about already, or you know, go, or government options that for that will force those prices down. And I think that we need to cut out middlemen. I think there needs to be a defi- I do think there needs to be a defined process for things like healthcare, like because there's so much bloat in the middle with insurance companies, everything else, that 
so many so many greases palms being greased that it's also driving up the, the cost those need to be removed okay but i mean healthcare is its, its own i mean we could talk for hours on healthcare alone yeah uh, well this is why i'm a huge fan of disruptive innovation I, you know you're you're proposing top down solutions which obviously you know those dovetail nicely into overall trusting you know the the system um i lean towards let's just protect little competitors and allow them to grow and stop putting up barriers to entry in their way because then they will go attack those big you know giant behemoths and they will force pricing to come down over time like there's no reason with today's technology that if the licensing around doctors and the legal liability like if there were some carve outs for completely tech based healthcare to exist that you could get better health outcomes delivered to you at your home by primarily technologically driven um solutions and we would all be way better off but the you know the path from here to there is one where your local hospital isn't allowed to block those types of services from existing in the first place. Well, we have to be careful too. We don't want random tech companies just sending out, you know, pharmaceutical grade drugs either. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean and I don't think any of us are advocating for that, right? I yeah. think, I think, I think all of us are on the boat that regulation is necessary. Mm -hmm. I think, I think the, the key difference is that it uh, needs to be small, fair regulation, not overwhelming yeah. and yeah, I mean, that's, what got, that's what got us that's what got us that's what the opioid crisis caused right they were just handing out xanax and whatever yeah but know, that doesn't mean by default so small and efficient doesn't mean by default ineffective and i think i think that's the that's the key differentiator there i think i think too many times we equate small with bad because we somehow don't have the bandwidth we live in 2024 and we have a lot of different ways I worked at a company that did the most with nothing. And this is why my thinking has shifted so much because oh. I've seen it with my own two. No, Tesla. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Phillips was okay. <laughs> Tesla was a different level. Shout out <laughs> Phillips. My crew at Phillips, you're still watching this. Shout out Blaine, Cheryl, Jess, everybody. Lon, <laughs> Declan. Um, so many people. Brian. Um, and my entire team and Donna. <laughs> I can go down the list. Michael. Okay. Um, You're not allowed to stop now. You said too many names. And you leave yeah. me, I won't hear. <laughs> Damn it. I said too many. No, but so I saw with my own two eyes how much can be done with almost nothing, right? Like the analogy I use is like when I worked at Tesla, they gave us sticks and stones and they wanted us to build a spaceship. And initially I'm like, this is the dumbest. This is, I, I can't believe that they're forcing people to do this. This is crazy. And then you realize that if you surround yourself with the right people, you can do it. Yeah. And so that was a giant aha moment. Like a light bulb went off for me. That is like, if we're able to create a magnet for the right people, anything is possible. Anything. I have some dumb people out there, dude. I'm not sure. Not, anything is you just got to create a magnet to attract the correct people at that time for that job. And you have to have the right leadership in place to motivate them and empower them and give them all the tools they need to be successful. Right. And so fundamentally speaking, fundamentally speaking, when you think of a government and a corporation, they are literally the same exact thing. They are a group of people that come together to execute something. That is, there is no fundamental difference between a corporation and a government. The, the government, their, their rule set is around ensuring the, that the will of the people is met and they, and they serve in that capacity for the corporation is to fulfill the profit motives of the, of the company. And you have a thousand different ways to achieve that either through culture or through partnership or through whatever, whatever different ways you can do that. Right. But in the end, it's a group of people coming together to do something. Right. And so in my head, when I see government, I see they are so far away from the optimal solution. Right? They're like on a different planet that to me, it's like any sort of any sort of even even a 10 percent improvement or a 20 percent improvement is going to yield so much additional wealth and uh and power back to every single american from every single part of the uh, uh um wage spectrum let's say that that is where i see the potential right versus like the incremental moving forward making it bigger making it slower by default because you're making it bigger right 
so on and so forth. But uh, now well, we're going we on circles. I don't want to keep bigger, going on circles here. Yeah. Because you are cutting things out. You know what I mean? And I would argue by trust busting, you're making a bunch of small competitors, which are going to, by nature, going to be more agile, more innovative, right? And it's going to move things forward. Uh, when you have most industries in America today, you've got two or three different companies that are, you know, uh, the, you know, the major power players and they're slow. They're, they don't, they, they usually lack innovation. I mean, look at the car. I mean, look at, uh, you know, legacy auto, right? Would you rather be legacy auto or would you rather be Tesla? And the reason for that is Tesla, or at least for the last 10 years, much smaller, much more ab agile, much more innovative. You break up a Ford, you break up a Chevy, something like that. You get three or four, 10 different companies. They're competing. You different. Know, I'm not saying they're going to compete with Tesla, but I think, I think my point still stands. Well, I, I, I don't think it does, right? Because you, that exact analogy is the reason why it doesn't work. Like let's, let's assume Ford had a monopoly in the United States and you break up Ford. And you have a Tesla that was brought from scratch, made from scratch, with a completely different set of culture and values, right? That that drive the company forward. It doesn't. You could split Ford up into twenty thousand different car companies. There, it's just it's just a different animal. It, it it wasn't born in the fire that it needed to be born in to espouse the values that Tesla has as a company to be successful at the level they've been successful. You don't get that by just making it leaner. It's, it's probably it's a bad like, example. Auto is probably a bad example, but 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 I think I think that applies to every single like to that applies to every single sector. Like just by breaking up the company doesn't automatically mean it's going to be leaner or it's going to be fundamentally different or they're going to have a meaningful it, that they're going to have like this giant change, right? Like if you, if you, like literally take that Tesla example, Tesla has fundamentally changed what it means to be in a car. Fundamentally, like well, yeah, but fundamentally the, thing, speaking, though, the ones that don't change are out on the vine and die because they will no longer be quote unquote too big to fail, right? And the ones that do change and the ones that, that do make it more agile are going to thrive. But it's, but it's, okay, so it makes some sort of incremental improvement, <laughs> right? But it's not going to have this world changing effect that you would have by just allowing the, the smallest player to come in and empowering every small player to start fresh and think from the ground up instead of, instead of adopting what was broken and then try to make it better because that's by default what's going to happen if you break it up go ahead hans i don't you want to jump in i well i like i think we agree so you know keith is aligned with more competition i think we're aligned with more competition i think that's kind of a, a big shared value there are you like how much do you work with software keith i'm an it consultant Okay, so I mean, Not at the, all. the way <laughs> the way that I think about this is that you know our government is kind of like a code base that's a legacy code base that was you know built in Cobalt and or you know written in assembly or whatever, and then lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of layers have been just built up on top of it over time, and I feel like we still need the core functionality that was written into the system, but we need to do a rewrite from scratch in a modern architecture. Do you know what I do, Don Fonts? No. I'm an IT consultant, particularly with CRM systems, customer management systems, for state governments. So what you're talking about is literally what I do. Like, that's my job. So, so yeah, I mean, I guess that's that's the way that I think about what government efficiency needs to achieve is to like remove the number of layers, simplify the interfaces, clean up a lot of the places where data leaks or energy leaks or all those types of things and, and make it functional, you know, tight and functional again. Yes, exactly right. And unfortunately, when you do this, and uh, go back to the incremental change, because guess what? Every single time you do this, you're going to have that old, that old person who's been there since 1980 that still focuses on their hotkeys and still has their, you know, posted st stamp and their fax machine across the hall. And they're going to be like, I've been doing this since 1985. Why do I got to change now? And you're like, well, actually, because all your processes are broken and they suck, but you can't say that you got to kind of like massage them a little bit. I this is where I did tell me. Why can't, where can I use my hotkeys while I was implementing an entirely new system? So 
That guy yeah, just got fired. What's that? <laughs> I said that guy just got fired in the new system. I think so, which is so super he, unpopular and politically impossible. Honestly, like you know, and I think Elon brought this up, but like I'm in passing, but it's like so so you you here's what I find so interesting about you, Keith, is that you have direct experience with how inefficient our government is. Correct. You know like and and it's safe to assume that given that and given all the other places where government has spent incredible amounts of money for low results and incredible amounts of time for low results, that mm -hmm. this is pervasive. And we know this, right? What? And it's Nothing shocking hits. to me that somebody that that is comfortable with, like that, that knows that is almost like comfortable with that reality. Like you're comfortable with that reality that this is how it is. And the way like it's, it's not going to be possible to change it in any meaningful way. That we just have to kind of like just every every four years chip away, chip away, chip away, chip away. No, like it's yeah. I, I tell you, let me make sure. Let me make sure I'm absolutely clear here. I think that the Democratic Party in this in this current election, 2024 election, incremental change is better than the alternative. That I believe. I am not saying in any way, shape, or form that I'm not opposed for a vast shift. I see. You know, but in that's this fair, election. That's fair. If I'm looking yeah. at my options, I will take incremental change over what I see as a horrible option. Got right? it. Now, 2028 rolls around and someone says, hey, here's how we can clean up our healthcare system as opposed to concepts of an idea. Thank you, Trump. Um, or here's how we can change our education system. Here's how we are going to take out special interests. Here is how we are going to rein in monopolies. Um, and we're going to, and we're going to make them government much more efficient in this way, this way, and this way by doing it. If they were a Republican, Libertarian, Green Party, I don't give a damn. I would absolutely vote for them. But in the here and now, in 2024 America, that is yeah. not an option. So I would take said, incremental change over the alternative. Well, so here's where the, you know, the mainstream media will come back in. I think if I'm just hypothesizing about a world in 2028 where we have that candidate, Yes. I can also hypothesize about exactly the type of media coverage I would expect that candidate to receive. Socialism. And it sure sounds like the kind of it would be coverage socialism. that we see today. Harry Truman said that anything that anything that does good for all normal, all common people will be called socialism. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically the quote. Um, and I promise you, anything that I'm talking about would be called socialism, communism, you know, so on and so forth. That's that's the. I think Hans is going the other way. No, yeah, yeah, Hans, yeah, Hans is yeah, right. I think I think Hans is saying that if if that if like the media will make it like that person is actually that, but they're not. Is that a fair? Like, I just want to make sure. I agree with Hans. The 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 the. Hold on, will, let, let let's see what Hans. I want to make right. sure Hans is clear. Yeah, good. yeah. The only point is that they would de like anyone who is going to bring that amount of dramatic change to the system would be like demonized to the 10th degree and whatever the form of that you know yeah. like i think they would call them hitler just because hitler is the go-to epithet so kind of kind of like kind of like trump yeah but but longer hey hitler trump says hitler right things like and like the, the mainstream media doesn't have to say anything like just listen to the dog <laughs> but i agree with hans in that they would be vilified Anybody would, that would that would be a mass disruptor will be vilified. But fortunately for all of us, and you guys have talked about it a lot, is that the mainstream media is dying significantly. They took a massive hit in 2023. 2024 is not any better. Um, I mean, podcasts are much more, you know, popular now or alternate, we'll call it alternate media sources, right? So... That's not going to matter as much. Be one fact about the fact that there that there's only a couple players in the mainstream media um, is they're slow and they're old and they're not agile, so they don't adjust. There are exceptions. There are certain people that still talk, but they they have a lot of problems that they can't fix. So yeah, yeah. what's well, I, the I think craziest? That their vilification will be less impactful in 2020. I think I think that's a very Awesome I prediction. And I, yeah, I agree with that 100% too. I think yeah. what, what's been eye opening running a YouTube channel is that a lot of mainstream media, they're just taking posts from Twitter X 
and they're reporting on them like 24 hours later. <laughs> it's, it's like amazing. Okay, yeah. let me let me let's wrap up with this because I would love to hear your thoughts here. We've almost gone for two hours. This is this went by fast as fuck. Oh, oh man, the time flies. You're having fun, man. That's so awesome. I would really appreciate you coming on and kind of like you have it's two v one, and and I really appreciate you like you know hold your your, your own and all all that shit. So yeah, I don't it's, take it it's that been way, cool. I just enjoy talking. No, I know. Yes, yeah. it's just a conversation. Yeah, yeah conversation. Exactly. We have a we have a Ron Paul libertarian. We've got a uh, a classical liberal, and then we have a illegal immigrant. I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> I got one of those too. I'm not. I'm, I'm American one. It's fine. <laughs> I'm legal. God damn it. Okay. So who do you think wins? Legal. Who do you think wins next week? And and I would love to hear your like your mechanics behind who you think wins, and uh, yeah, and what why do you think that person will win? So uh, obviously, I would like Kamala to win. That and I statistical think. statistical likelihood that that result is actually no, no, the, I understand. Um, I I would say I would like Kamala to win. I'm. On record, we talked about this a lot, Z. Um, I, I had it for the longest at 55, 45 Kamala. And the reason was because I thought that Trump would take Georgia. I thought Trump would take Arizona. I think, think Kamala might actually take North Carolina based off all the polls I was seeing. I thought that I thought Kamala would take PA. And since 1992, anything, every way that PA is gone, Michigan and Wisconsin have also gone. So if that happens, that's the election right there. Right. Also, Kamala was running about four to five points ahead in the popular vote. So, and that's a good, that's about where she needed to be. Um, now over the last week, things have changed in that they have swung a little bit farther to the right. So now I'm putting it probably 55, 45 Trump, just because most of the, um, enthusiasm, you know, particularly here in Georgia or wherever. Um, most, a lot of the polls I've seen are a dead heat, but more so, um, the biggest thing I've seen is that, um, places that Kamala needs to crush, like absolutely destroy African-American vote, um, women, young voters, she's still winning, but it's not good enough to win those if you're Kamala. Like she has to uh, obliterate Trump and he has enough. Um, the, the reason I do, I still give her 45 percent. Is because if you, if you look at a lot of the, um, if you look at a lot of the voter enthusiasm charts, they're much, much higher in the, for Dems than they used to be. Sorry, one second. I got, uh, uh, my bad guys. You got cut off there. Yeah. By the way, um, there's a lot of the Dem enthusiasm charts are in the seventies, whereas they used to be, you know, 50, 55, 60, even for 2020 and 2016. So there's a lot more base enthusiasm, whereas the Republican enthusiasm is actually lower. So there's still a, a good chance. And if Kamala wins, this will be the reason is because the base is, the base turned out much more for the Dems than the Republicans, um, which, and I'll just add one more thing. The reason I think that she's going on call her daddy or club Shay Shay um, podcasts is that she really wanted to go call her daddy is overwhelmingly women club Shay Shay is overwhelmingly African-American, right? She's really focusing on those demographics to get those numbers back up and then relying on the base to turn out that it's obvious to me. That's why her strategy, that's where her strategy is. And that's obvious. It's obvious to me. That's the reason she didn't go to Joe Rogan, which is 80% males, right? So, I mean, to me, what you can disagree or agree with or whatever you want. It's obvious that's a strategy. So we'll see if it plays out, but um, 55, 45 Trump at this point. Hans, how are you seeing it? Well, it's hard for me to feel like I have a, a good handle on this. And we've you know, discussed this, just living in the independent media bubble, like it looks from my vantage point like a landslide, but that's because Trump is the stick it to the establishment guy and the independent media landscape is, you know, I would say heavily stick it to the guy leaning. So, um, that said, I do feel like there's been so much enthusiasm. I, first of all, I think one of the dynamics that we saw in 2016 was that there was a level of preference falsification where people who wanted to vote for Trump weren't comfortable saying that they were going to vote for Trump. 
I don't believe that that sentiment exists today, at least not in any meaningful way. Like, I think the people who want to support Trump are pretty okay being vocal about saying that we're going to support Trump. So I don't think that there's going to be this discrepancy in the polls versus, you know, the election day results um, that we've seen in the past. And I think some people are kind of counting on that. And I, I don't think that I agree that it's fair to expect that. that. So I, I think that the actual results might actually go somewhat the other way, just because if people are too confident that Trump is going to win, that the voter turnout might not be as good. And so instead of him actually doing better in the election than in the polling, I think we could be running into a situation where he does better in the polling than he does in the election, which would be you know a dramatic shift from previous elections in in this dynamic. Uh, so I, I think that, yeah, that makes it a closer race than we think it is, but I still put it more likely that Trump wins probably 60, 40, something to that effect. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think from my standpoint, the, the biggest shift that I've seen. So w- one of the things that sticks out to me has been the flight away from the Democrat party. If you look at all the different polls, party affiliation, identification, and Gallup uh, has been running this poll for the uh, better part of a year. Is they're tracking to see uh, what kind of affiliation advantage the Democrats have in each election cycle, and they've gone all the way back to 1992. And consistently every year, Democrats have a significant Democrat. Uh, they had significant affiliation percentage uh, benefit. Uh, you know, when B- Obama became president, I think there were plus seven. So there were there were seven point seven. Seven percentage points more people that identified as Democrat leaning than Republican. Whereas in 2024, it's basically even. It's one point, and at, uh, many times uh, during the during the year, it's actually been Republican leaning, right? And in the years where the Republicans have won the electoral college, uh, that was a direct result of the party affiliation being uh, so, so somewhere below four percentage points for the Democrats. Whenever the Dems had a four point or higher lead in party affiliation, they won the popular vote by default, but also the Electoral College. When it was below four, they uh, the, the Republican won the Electoral College. They haven't won the popular vote since 19, since Reagan, the 1970s, or no, since uh, since Bush in 2004. Uh, he, he beat Kerry in the popular vote. Um, so so that is a trend that that's, sticks out to me, is that the party affiliation is is in the Democrats' disfavor. It's in the Republicans' favor, which by default means that there's going to be a, a bigger Republican turnout. Okay? So that's one. The other thing that I've seen is that the independent block is also getting bigger. There's more independent voters now than ever, right? Which means that they're leaving both the Democrat and the Republican Party. And uh, by and large, 75% plus of them do not trust mainstream media. There's there's another Gallup poll that has been tracking trust in mainstream media. We all know, like, basically nobody trusts mainstream media now. But there is, there is a, there's one candidate that has done a really good job reaching that block of voters, in my opinion, that's Trump. And that, that, that top 10 list of podcasts, if we look at it, right, the ones that have the highest reach the the ones that are the, the party that's really trying to exploit that demographic is the Republicans, right? So they're stepping away outside of their core base and they're trying to get the biggest voting block, which is independence, right? And that's where a lot of the undecideds are as well. They're the biggest uh they're the biggest voting block, which by default, if there's four, five, six percent independent undecideds, by default, that's gonna be your biggest net number. In addition to that, for the last few years, there's uh, there's been disenfranchised. You know, the, the system. People are upset with the system. They're disenfranchised. There, there's people that are just simply not voting, right? And I think these kinds of discussions that the Trump uh, campaign has been doing in, in podcasts specifically, I think it's going to activate a voting base that perhaps is tough to track. And I th- I think that's going to be a surprise, in my opinion. I think that's going to be a surprising result. So I'm I'm actually I'm. I'm very bullish Trump. I, I think I think 80% plus Trump victory. Uh and I think and I think it will be a surprise because uh uh and, and I, Hans's point is very, very interesting because he's saying that hey, a lot of these are probably being vocal already. So when you're polling, you're gonna be capturing these. But I, I don't know if that's truly the case. I think something has shifted this election cycle 
especially with you know the world richest guy with the biggest platform it's one of the biggest platforms when he throws his hat in the ring that's going to have some sort of quantifiable impact that's going to be tough to track because it's been such a big change to the landscape but i could be wrong but that's how i'm reading the the well, situation yeah well, it's, 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 well there's 100 million users on x in america 30 million uh 30 is two to one male female and 30 percent use it for politics so you figure 30 million so you're figuring you know whatever you know 50, so you know 20 20 million male men and how many of them can you convert i think the key thing is the convert factor right two, because you right. can make an argument a lot of them are are probably we're going to vote for trump anyway mm -hmm. but like the question becomes is like where where can you convert the most voters, right? And I think I think Kamala's strategy has been activating the base she knows she can get. And I think Trump's strategy is trying to convert those that would not vote for him to vote for him. Not necessarily steal away from Kamala, but to activate people like he did in 2016, a very but similar I'd argue, strategy. I'd argue that somebody like Rogan has a vast majority of Trump voters anyway. I mean... Yeah. Because, I mean, he's, first of all, it's 80, 20 male, female, uh, male skew Republican, just that's stats, right? I mean, and Rogan, you know, UFC guy, everything else. I mean, that's just a, you know, macho. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's, but Trump's, even, it's Trump's wheelhouse, right? But my point is, by my point is a, a 10% not Trump voter on Rogan, let's say, mm -hmm. right? The net number of people on that platform is significantly bigger. Mm -hmm. Like the, the reach is so large that even a small percentage point that can be converted, that the number of those people is actually very big. Sure. And I think that, that's daddy like the what, strategy. I mean, call, I mean, I'm not saying Caller Daddy is anywhere near Rogan, but it's still the number three or four podcast in the nation, right? It's no scrub. Um, so close yeah, but, but like when the, eight, I think. Um, yeah, but, but when you, but it's a compounding effect as well, right? So you have like, you have basically the top four, you have Rogan, Tucker, uh, Ryan Shaw, there was one other one, Theo. When you put those four together and you're thinking about the reach of that, plus the space he had with Elon on X, that's, mm -hmm. that's a podcast. That was a two hour long conversation. Right. Yeah, but that's kind of like a debate. Everybody that watched that either watched it because they're still there voting for Trump or they watched it because they hated Trump. But my they're point, but my point is that even in the, with the laws of statistics, even if you say only 1% of those people would actually significant, like vote their, change their vote, 1% mm -hmm. of 200 million, that's a lot of people. That is yeah, a lot people, of people. On, people. If it's 2 million people in PA, it could swing the election, 1,000%. There are two things I would like to point out there. The first thing, the Hans, is, Hans is dead on, I think. So good job, Hans. Um, there have been numerous articles that have come out from nonpartisan sources that say that the polls are, there are much, much fewer pollsters, but much higher quality pollsters um, than they were four years ago because the poll industry is like, wow, we got embarrassed. Two, year, you know, two elections in a row, we have to change. There's been a massive shift. So I think that I could, I could look like a jackass six days from now, whatever. But I, I think that the polls are going to be pretty accurate, which is why they're so close. Um, two more things. I, th I think that the early voting really benefits Trump. He's been pushing that instead of calling it a conspiracy theory the last couple of, you know, last year or so. And usually Dems crush early voting, crush mail in voting. That's not the case now. I mean, they're winning it, but not by the margins they need. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that don't underestimate the ground game. Because look, I, as you know, I ran a couple of campaigns, local, but nonetheless, I mean, the fair, the bones are still the same, right? Um, people are lazy. If, if you don't get them to go vote, a lot of them won't. And Kamala's ground game and her infrastructure, door knockers, you know, people like that is far superior to Trump's. And in an election like this, that's a big deal. Because if you get over the core, over the seven swing states, if knocking on doors, talking to people, you know, you know, over and over and over again, getting out the boat, if you get an extra two or three million people out the boat, that could be the election. So in a blowout, it won't matter. But if it's on the margins, I mean, that's a big deal, right? So that's something we, you should probably consider as well. Yeah, that's fair. Okay, Hans. I have a somewhat radioactive question to ask both of you that you can take it or leave it, but just like for my own curiosity, one of the things that I have a hard time quantifying, and so this is why I'm asking the question, is what is the impact for more moderate progressives of the just kind of 
insane tail end of the gender ethics portion of the progressive party. Like I support marriage equality, but a lot of the stuff going on with schools and like the, the bill in California where the schools can actually help kids get gender affirming care without the parents consent, like that kind of stuff. Does that play into the decisions for, for moderate Democrats who maybe like historically would have been progressive, but that goes a little bit too far. I'm so glad you asked that question. I really am. First off, dude, our education system can't even get kids free lunches. Are they, are they, are they going to perform a gender affirming care of a $40,000 surgery over, over their lunch break? Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't think that's, that's a thing, but let's say it is a thing. I'll, I'll, you know, just say for whatever reason, that's the case. Um, I don't care. Not because I agree with it or disagree with it. I don't care. Like the, the transgender, you know, he, him crowd, that is like 1% of 1% of 1% of the population, right? We went, uh, went crazy and decided, you know what? We are going to give every transgender person, uh, whatever, whatever surgery you want. It would still be pennies in the grand scheme of things. Right. I didn't. So, I mean, so yeah, I mean, the, the brain, the bottom line is no, I just, I just don't care. Do I necessarily agree with it? No, but it doesn't, it doesn't swing it because there's just so many other important things that are just way, way bigger on the grand, the grand scheme of things. I, I don't really think about it because I know it's such a small issue, but I do not, uh, I do not like the fact like for, I live in California, so I could care less what California does. Right. But I definitely disagree with with uh, rules and regulations and laws that they're putting in place that actively prevent a teacher to potentially hold, a, like they incentivize a, a teacher to hold a secret from the parent of the child out of fear of retaliation with because of how they identify. I think that I think that is a that's a problem, right? Because the the the, the thought process is like, hey, there are some families that are abusive to the child. So if the child is telling the teacher that, hey, they're, they're thinking that they're, they think they're a she instead of a he, that the teacher has, doesn't have to tell the parent that, right? Like so a fundamental change to the, to the, to the child potentially that they're not comfortable maybe telling their parents for whatever reason that the teacher can be like, hey, like I don't have to tell the parent that they told me that. That is as a new, as a new parent. Okay. I like to think that I'm going to be very connected to the child. Right. And that he, that he or she, whichever child I have. Is that they're going to tell me how mm -hmm. how they feel, right? So I think I'm going to be able to create a bond. But but in the off chance that for some reason on that day they bring it up, right? And, or, or there's something going on where they say something, and then the teacher is somehow uh, not required to communicate a, a significant, let's say, impact to that child's how they're thinking about themselves. That they're not forced to tell me that, or they, or they, or they're, or they're prevented by law by not having to communicate that. That's a problem, right? So but I don't think it's a big issue. I'll, it's I'll it's just, not a big issue in my head. Yeah, right it's, now. it's not a big issue. But I will say this: like, as of I got three kids. If you, if if your if if your if kids if the kids have to tell the teacher and you have to find out from the teacher, then you need to step up your parenting game. Straight up, because a thousand kid, percent agreed. Yeah, yeah, kid obviously had, does not feel comfortable telling you things, but it doesn't justify. Like, yeah. But it doesn't justify the state overstepping their their duty to the parent. I think. I think. I think both things are true. I think yep. the parent needs to do a better job to understand their child, and the state shouldn't be holding secrets from the parent. I mean, you know I what I'm saying? That. But yeah, I mean, but there. I mean, you could t talk about a lot of things. I mean, it's personal responsibility. Like, I think at that point, it just comes out to personal responsibility. That's why I personally don't worry about it because I know I'm going to be a good enough parent where this is not going to be an issue. Yeah, this is. These are probably parents. I'm not. I'm. I'm generalizing here, but a lot of these parents probably aren't too thrilled that their kid is gay, right? Or maybe there's some. You I know, think a lot of parents offload responsibility on the state and other and other things. I think that I think that's the bigger issue is that I think. I think there are parents out there that are comfortable with the system parenting their child. 
I thousand I thousand yeah. percent agree with that. And I think that is the fundamental issue with that. But again, that's not my problem because that's not going to happen to my child. Thousand percent not my problem. Yeah. So does that answer your question? Okay. He said yeah, but he's muted. yeah. Okay. <laughs> awesome. All right, let's wrap it up. Over two hours. Uh, Keith, where can people find you? Um, I'm at the Keith Griffin um, on YouTube and on X. So please uh, follow me. I'm going to be putting together some new videos here in the next couple of days. So particularly mid election season. So I'm excited about it. And uh, yeah, looking forward to growing that and hanging out with you guys. So appreciate it. Hell yeah. White dude for white dudes for Harris. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I, am, I am a white dude and I am voting for Harris, but I'm not a white dude for Harris. Come on, though. Come yeah. on, bro. <laughs> dude, it just makes, it makes him sound like a cuck. I don't know what it is about oh, that so label. Why do, why do they have to be so cucky? Why? <laughs> yeah. why why can't you just be normal freaking people man all right uh cool thank you everybody all right i'm gonna end Look. recording let's see